Hey, what's up everyone? This is Greg. Welcome back to our Intermediate Core Data video tutorial series. In this video, we'll look at some more advanced topics when it comes to core data model attributes, validation, constraints, fetched properties, and transformable types. Here's what the app will look like by the end of this video and challenge. You'll have a core data validation rule checking for names that are too short, and you'll also have an image stored as part of the device record. As you set up your attributes in the data model editor, you can also set validation rules. For strings, you can have core data enforce minimum and maximum lengths or match against a regular expression. For date fields, you can enforce a minimum start date and a maximum end date, and so on. You can also set a unique constraint on a particular field. For example, in a list of employees, you might have the employee ID or social security number be a unique field. In the demo coming up in a minute, you'll see how to add a validation rule and how to catch validation errors on save. We'll look at the unique constraint in the next video on mapping models. Aside from attributes and relationships, you can also add fetched properties to your core data entities. These are like computed properties on objects in Swift in that they're like read-only properties that perform a stored fetch request. When adding one to a property, you just specify an entity and a predicate. When you access the property at runtime, Core Data will execute and cache the results and then return an array with those results to you. The final thing you'll look at in the upcoming challenge is transformable attributes. Aside from the usual types like strings, integers, and floats, Core Data can also store binary NS data. Classes that conform to NS coding, such as UI image and UI color, can be archived to NS data, stored in Core Data, and then later on unarchived back to the original type when you access it. Core Data uses NS keyed archiver to do this transformation, which means you can put your own class types into a Core Data field with the transformable type. All you need to do is make your class conform to NS coding, or just provide a custom NS value transformer class to handle the two way transformation to and from NS data. We're here in the data model editor. Let's try adding some validation rules to see how those play out. I'm going to switch to the person entity. And let's look at the name attribute. I'll open the utilities here. And we've got a bunch of properties here. Optional, we've already seen. Indexed, let's just check that. Why not? Since we're accessing people by their name, we can make that indexed, which should make things like sorting a little bit faster, as well as fetching. And what we really want to look at is validation. So we have these options here for minimum length, maximum length, and a regular expression. Let's go with minimum length and say that names have to be at least two characters. Apologies to all those people with one character names. So we'll put that in for minimum length. We don't have to set a maximum length. And I'll just save the model. And that'll be it. Now the question is, when is the validation going to run? Let's head over to the people table view controller. Make a little room. And now when you add a person, remember you get that alert view pop up with a text field. It'll ask you for the name. And if you look at the code here, you'll see that it is checking that there is something there. So it is looking for it. It's making sure that the text you enter is not empty. If it's not empty, it's going to use the entity to create a new managed object, set the name, and then here's our call to save and then reload the table view. Let's have a look and see what happens when we run this. I'll switch over to people. Let's try to add somebody. Here's a name with many characters in it. I'll go ahead and hit add. That looks pretty good. And if I try to add someone with just a single character name, such as Q, and I hit add, and it seems the app has crashed. And you'll see it's crashed here in our save main context in our core data stack. And if you look at the console here, here's our object. It's a person object. Name is Q. And you can see NS validation error value. The operation couldn't be completed. And the error here is error saving main managed object context, which is 
the same text we have over here. So you can see that when you try to save the context, it runs the validation, it detects that something went wrong with something in the validation, and then won't let you save it. And our current remedy in our core data stack save main context is just a trap and call fatal error. Let's head back to the code in the people table view controller. In this case, we know that if the validation fails, then the save main context is going to do something bad. We don't actually want it to crash the app. We want to probably catch the error and present a warning message. That means we can't use this implementation of save main context, and we're going to have to do a save and have a try catch block to catch the error ourselves. Let's go ahead and implement that. I've set up my do and catch. I'm going to call save right on the managed object context directly rather than using that helper method. And the first thing I'm going to do in the catch block, you'll notice, is to delete that object. The problem here is that the save may have failed, but that object is still lingering around our managed object context. Remember, the managed object context is our working area, and it still contains the person with that invalid single character name. And even if we catch and we recover and we show an error message, that record is actually still going to be there. And the next time we try to save, the validation will fail again. So the first thing I want to do is delete the offending record. And then we'll just pop up a nice error message to the user. We're going to set up a UI alert controller with the alert style, error message, OK button, and then just present it. And then we can just move on. We'll refresh the table. That's fine. But then the app will continue, and it won't crash anymore. We hope. Let's build and run and give it a try. Go over to the People tab. Let's try to add a person, single character. And now we get an error saying a person's name must be longer than a single character. Again, apologies to Q. But the app is here and we're continuing as usual. That looks good. Let's head back to the data model and we'll have a look at fetched properties. I'm going to switch over to the device entity. We've looked at attributes, we've looked at relationships, and now there's this mysterious fetched property down here. This is uh, probably not so widely used, but let's have a look and see what it's good for. I'm going to add one, and let's just give it a name. The idea here is that it's not quite a relationship, but it's a property that you would need a predicate to access. You can almost think of it as like a stored predicate that's right inside the entity for easy access. Since we're on our list of devices, then let's say if you have a device that was purchased on a certain day, and you want to find all other devices that were purchased on that day, sort of to find the device's birthday buddies, if you will, then that's something that we could use. It's not quite a relationship, because it's not like those devices are related to each other in any official way. It's more just they have something in common. So in this case, let's set up a fetch property for that. We'll call it purchased on same date. Let me open the inspector here. We have a destination. Is it going to be a person or is it going to be a device? We want a list of devices. And now let's fill in the predicate. I'll fill it in over here. There's a little bit more room. So it's purchased on same date. You can see the predicate here. It's going to find other device records where the purchase date is the same as, and fetch source here is the current record. So we're going to find all the devices where the purchase date is the same as this record's purchase date. All right, we've got that set up in the model. Let's head over to the detail screen here, and we'll see if we can use that. I'm not going to set up any interface for this. We'll just kind of log it out to the console so you can see what it looks like. And then if you want to add the interface to uh, when you're looking at a particular device, maybe in the table view, you could show its birthday buddies in there if you want. We'll just log it out to the console for now. I'm here in view will appear, and we have a little if let binding here to see if we have a purchase date. Remember, purchase date is an optional field. And I'll add the code underneath here.
you can set up a dynamic property to access it with property access. In this case, I'm just going to use value for key to access that fetched property, and we're expecting it to be an array of device objects. If it is, then we just iterate through the array, and then I'm just going to print out the device's birthday buddy's name here. You'll notice this line up here where I'm calling refresh object. The way fetch properties work is the first time you access it, that value is actually going to be cached and will stay the same forever for the rest of the time the context is around. That means if you run this line here, and then you set some other devices to have the same purchase date, and then you come back to this code, it's just going to use the cached version. So what this refresh object call here does is to clear that cache and make sure we're getting fresh data. Let's build and run, and we'll keep an eye on the console. But first, we'll need to set some purchase dates. Let's go with device number three, this watch. Let's set date to August 3rd. Then we'll go to device number six. Let's set this birthday to, or purchase date to August 3rd. Let's go to this uh, phone number four. Set its purchase date to August 3rd. And now if I return to the device number three watch, and you come into the console, you'll see that indeed it has three other birthday buddies, including itself, because the predicate will include itself. But we have those two other ones here. So that's the way that fetched properties work. It's like a stored predicate inside your model, and then you just call it like, a, like any other property. That's it for this video tutorial, and as always, we like to leave you with a challenge. The project already includes the user interface for attaching an image to a device object. And in the challenge, you'll add the transformable attribute along with the supporting code. You'll find all the details in the challenge document along with a complete walkthrough in case you need some help along the way. I hope you've enjoyed this video tutorial. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.